We have inherited so much from the fathers that have gone before us who have loved you. And we have inherited such a rich <coughs> heritage of liberty, Christian liberty in our, in our country. And I pray that you would grant to us that we might use these gifts and liberties to their maximum potential while we have them to your glory. Pray for your uh, help this morning that we could be able to get through this seminar in a meaningful way. All to your own glory. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is the high school orientation seminar, and if you have never had a, a student before in the high school, this is mandatory session. If you already have a high school student, <clears throat> I'm glad you're here for a refreshing. You can catch us if we've changed anything. Um, my, what I've done this year that I haven't done before is I have the whole blue manual that you have for the high school. We're going to be going over this manual here. Um, and the whole manual is on my slideshow. Basically, that's what my slideshow is going to be. So you can follow along directly. Um, I gave wide margins so you can write notes, uh, extra notes that you might need right in the book. I prefer if you would take your notes in the book so that um, you have it all in one spot when you have to look it up. Um, it really is our intention that you have one of these handbooks per student that's in high school so they can sort of keep track of their own um, process. In the middle of the handout, we won't spend much time on it, but there's a, a student planner section in the middle so that the student can sort of uh, get a bird's eye view of their high school courses. Um, <clears throat> I have 80 slides and 80 minutes. <laughs> I'm accustomed to speaking about 80 minutes on each slide. <laughs> so we'll see what we can do here. Um, essentially, when we start high school, what we're trying to do is continue the philosophy of education that um, you were supposed to be following already. There is a distinction in terms of difference because in high school, uh, there's something called high school diploma. And um, I am amazed at the political football the high school diploma is becoming in Annapolis. I have no idea what, will, what the future will hold. Um, up to this point in time, it's important that you understand that the Walkersville High School Diploma has always met the guidelines for private schools in the state of Maryland. We organized the program initially off of the non-public school regulations. As a Christian school, we're not obligated to necessarily keep that regulation, but what's important when you think about a high school diploma, think of it as a currency. When you have a dollar and you're buying something in a, in a store that uses dollar currency, we all are talking the same language. Uh, if you switch currency to uh, a, some kind of foreign exchange, then there would be potentially doubt and confusion as to how much something was when you, when you change the currency. Um, the high school diploma is the standard currency of the American education system forever. And as a, as a result, it's the goal of Walkersville to deliver a diploma that, that, that reasonably meets standard expectations of uh, post-secondary institutions or applications. And that means that uh, if you're going into the armed services, for example, um, Walkersville has been blessed so far to receive a Tier 1 military status. Tier 1 is what all private schools and public school students are granted if they have the minimum course curriculum uh, that meets the, the requirements. So um, we're, we're blessed with that status. <coughs> also, um, in most colleges, getting into most colleges, there's also that um, standard sense of what's going on. Now, it's important that you pay attention to the discussion because we have constructed the diploma to meet a broad spectrum of student needs. And therefore, 
uh, we have options for students of taking certain kinds of courses that would satisfy a diploma. The, the thing that we try to use as a primary guideline in all of the application of high school credit is if we're calling something Algebra 1, then on the transcript, we want that Algebra 1 course to mean Algebra 1 in the terms that everybody else thinks Algebra 1 means. So if you're taking a course called Algebra 1, but you're really doing Algebra 1 half, or you're doing Introduction to Algebra, <coughs> or Future Imaginations of What I Might Dream of Doing in Algebra, <laughs> um, we will adjust the title of the course accordingly so that when you have a transcript that says Algebra 1, it's the same currency that people use. And so that's the significant um, point of reference. Many colleges have requirements for entrance. Uh, college uh, prep, diploma, uh, I'll, I hope to repeat this uh, as I go through it, but a college prep diploma usually implies that your electives are used for certain things like instead of the minimum two math credits uh, that, we, that we require, um, a college prep diploma usually requires four math credits. The same thing goes for science. Instead of the two sciences, there's the four sciences. Instead of the two social studies, there's three social studies. So there's a little bit more um, focused study when you, when you want to have a college prep orientation to your diploma. And you need to be responsible for that understanding as you go through the development of a plan of course for your children. On the other hand, <coughs> um, college prep diploma also requires, uh, many colleges require two years of a foreign language from high school to get into that college. So those are the kind of things that you want to keep in mind. Because educational institutions uh, are available by the thousands, post-secondary education institutions, um, it's probably helpful if you have some idea of the institutions that you might be interested in to do a little bit of homework ahead of time to make sure that particular courses that your son or daughter is going to be taking it would be satisfactory if you have something specific in mind beyond that. <clears throat> that gets me back to the introduction here. We're a homeschool ministry. We have been a homeschool ministry uh, in the entire course of our uh, operation. And we really value what God wants to do in the home so that when we change your elementary program to a high school program, though we began the torture in the junior high, I guess, when we change that program over, the idea that we're after is that we recognize that the objectives that we as parents feel are appropriate for training and developing our children, those objectives can be structured and organized in a standard way so that high school credit can be received for the types of activities and courses that your student is taking and that variety, uh, there, there's quite a spectrum of potential and variety that your students can take from the Walkersville program. Um, I'm gonna let you uh, look at that thesis there. Um, I'm not gonna have time to go over it. I'm over my slide one allotment. <laughs> um, but it's important that you understand as we go through today's lecture Walkersville is focused on individual plans for individual students as much as possible. And one of the important things about an individual plan then is that every individual child needs to be evaluated and the parent's role, especially what we're really trying to encourage the father's role, uh, the, the parent's role is significant in prayerfully discerning the particular direction and opportunity and bent that that particular child is going to be training for. So um, when you look at some of the features <coughs> of um, our philosophy, I, I'd like to point you to this particular slide. However, um, I'm not going to be able to go through it because this is actually just uh, something to meditate on. But here are several things that the home reflects. And the curriculum that God is going to use in your home is more important than the diploma you're going to hold in your hand when you're done. And you know, when we say at Walkersville, 
we want to treasure God's design for the family. We also want to treasure the whole dynamic aspect of what the home can bring to a child. And so uh, these are some of those express ideas that we have as a school relating to the kinds of things that God is doing. Um, often interruptions come. And what's important for you and I to discern is the interruption that's happening caused by um, the necessity of better family discipline to turn back these interruptions, or is the, inter is the um, interruption something that God is allowing because he has an agenda that he's trying to put into our life that is different than perhaps we had in mind. And so it's important for us all to reckon with the fact that we all have interruptions, but at the same time, we must be careful in terms of discernment as to whether they're interruptions we need to govern by better discipline or if it's an interruption that we have to respond to and change our course of action. Now, <clears throat> one of the core beliefs of our program is not only that the child is created by God and has very specific purposes that God has in mind for the child should we uh, respond in obedience, we also see that uh, God has put children in specific homes. And so it's a, it's a balancing act that we try to maintain on a continuing basis to try to recognize the specific in, uh, elements of the individual homes and what God is bringing to a child in a particular home, and at the same time recognizing um, if we're going to have a high school program, high school diploma, that whatever we call a course, the title needs to reflect what the course covers, and the nature of that course needs to be defined well enough so that we can acknowledge this is what we've done, this is why we've done it, and we've granted a credit based upon that. Um, if you have any questions, try to save them to the end, but you might want to just write them down uh, so that you can get um, the, your questions answered. <clears throat> One of the things that's significant with the homeschool program is the need to value the, the duties of a home. And uh, I, would, I would just like to in, encourage you, part of the core philosophy is, uh, if your children learn to function dynamically well in your home, so that they are substantial contributors to its well-being and management, that contribution is not a small element of God's intended training for them. Uh, one of the mistakes that a homeschool family can make is for the parents to relieve the children of chores, as it were, so the children can do their schoolwork, for not realizing and forgetting the fact that uh, the chores, in many respects, are the homework that God has for the children. And so Walkersville encourages that, and we incorporate that. And you'll, you'll get to see some of those mechanisms, but with Christian service and work study and home ec and those kind of courses available, we make the most of those types of opportunities <clears throat> as we can. Um, in your book, you don't have this title. You have family honoring standards. But I just wanted to sort of accent the concept of father. And since I was making the slides over, I thought I could change wording. There isn't that much wording change. I think this is the only word I changed <laughs> in the manual. <laughs> but um, father honoring standards, uh, it's real important that you understand it appears that there could be tension between your home and our school, uh, inst uh, at, at our administration. But it's not our intention to have uh, any kind of stress or conflict between us. What we want to do is recognize that um, fathers have the priority of responsibility for making the decisions relating to the children. Now, by fathers, I'm not excluding moms. Obviously, in most cases, moms not only carry out the details, but they usually have a lot of input in terms of uh, what's going to be taking place. <clears throat> so to the degree uh, that we have a need in homeschooling, we have a need to include dads in a larger way. So it is our intention to try to uh, demonstrate that tangibly in the manner in which we conduct the, the high school activities. And so we do have um, several strategies that relate to that. Um, first of all, 
<clears throat> we like dads being a part of the oversight. And um, when you receive your, well, I'm going to say this and I'm asking David if he'll listen carefully to me so we can sort of just double check. <clears throat> We, we, we put systems in place and then sometimes they fall out of place and I don't know it. Um, but when you receive your home visit announcement, there's supposed to be on the back side a set of guidelines for dad. And what we like is for dad to do a home visit before we do a home visit. And when that occurs, several things happen. First of all, dad's brought into the center fold of the accountability and it's really important to Walkersville administration that the guy that gets hit the hardest administratively is the dad and our interaction is with the dad and our interaction with, with the moms we would like to have that as much as possible the least um, kind of tense or awkward element because your husband is in charge not us and you're answering to your husband's direction and uh, your giving an account to us really needs to be under that umbrella of your husband. So a practical tool that we've found tremendously useful is to have the fathers do a preliminary home visit, get everything ready for the visit, and sort of drop a little summary, and then there's a, the capability of presenting that information, even if dad can't be there. It's presented under the authority of dad and has a very significant impact both for us for the sons and daughters and uh, hopefully for the whole family. Um, so um, I think the only thing I also want to add here about the portfolio review meetings, um, uh, we're hoping that dads will be part of the family in a regular way in terms of worship and giving instruction, but um, in case <coughs> this has um, not happened yet in your home, beginning in junior high, what we like to try to do is have the students present their work directly to the staff for the junior and senior high school so that the students have ownership so that the accountability for their diploma is on their shoulders and again we relieve the moms of unnecessary interface as if you know we're going to be scolding you that's not going to happen uh, it's not our job to scold the wives our job will be to look to your sons and daughters and say well this was the plan, this is what you've done, this is what you haven't done, and if you continue at this rate, when you're 97, you'll graduate. <laughs> <coughs> compulsory attendance, I do, I wanna to touch on compulsory attendance laws, I mean, I mean, the compulsory attendance law, first of all, that's one of the big issues down in Annapolis this year, I was like, today's like the fourth compulsory attendance bill I'm testifying on. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but basically, up to this minute, compulsory attendance involves children up through, up, excuse me, up to age 16. And so um, what it's important for you to understand is whatever the compulsory attendance law says, due to other regulations and implementation of that law, your enrollment in Walkersville theoretically satisfies compulsory attendance laws your compliance with Walkersville actually satisfies the attendance loss. So what I'm saying is your compliance with attendance, as long as you're keeping up with the program that we've organized together, as long as that program is in conformity to our philosophy and we have it spelled out up front, know what we're talking about, your compliance with our program is compliance to the compulsory attendance regulation. <clears throat> Academic excellence is um, a term that sometimes causes some consternation. I was recently accused by a mom, it's been in this program a long time, that uh, seems like we're always harping on ac academic excellence. Um, and I wasn't quite sure what she was meaning, but um, I, th I think <clears throat> there's a little bit of a, str of a strain often between the manner in which a home functions versus uh, the manner in which a classroom functions. And so often moms feel like the term academic excellence means uh, we've got to turn our home into the model traditional classroom for it to be excellent. Uh, that isn't really what we have in mind. 
A uh, couple things to point out here real quickly. Uh, we do have systems of communication. One of the most important parts of excellence in your program is to communicate with us. The, actually, the only time we really start having things fall apart is when we lose contact, we lose communication, and you don't follow through. Also with that, um, we have standards of achievement. Now, that's, that's twofold. Number one, um, again, like I said earlier, if you're taking an Algebra One course, there's something that generally is acknowledged to be Algebra One. And if you're taking that course, we're going to want you to complete and satisfy that course in the standard that uh, any minimum achievement w would be considered having finished the course. So that's an important consideration. Num number three here, strategies for learning is based upon unique gifts and opportunities for each child. And that again gets back to the individualization so that your child can take courses more directly devised for their ability, their desires, your, your opportunities. And again, when you maintain compliance with the approved courses that you have established, that compliance with those courses keeps you within the standards of excellence that we're talking about here. And then hopefully you'll take, act, you'll, you'll take a part in the support services uh, that we have, which includes not only the home visits, but just a reminder, um, always and any time you need a sit-down appointment, especially at the office, that's available. We um, sometimes can meet you out on the field uh, or at a workshop, but um, probably the, the number one um, complaint over the years is people say, well, I didn't want to call you because I know you're so busy. And actually, since we are so busy, go ahead and call us so we can schedule in managing what, what's going on and, and what the needs are. Don't, don't make it delay so that when, when it finally comes up, it's more of a crisis, and then that's a little bit more difficult to, to squeeze in. Um, if you're pursuing graduation, then uh, completing these requirements uh, helps a father organize or, or a parent organize the specific goals uh, that you're going to be pursuing for your children. And we'll get into that obviously in a significant fashion. Uh, just a few of the colleges and universities that have accepted our diploma in the, in the past years. <clears throat> now we're going to start with a little bit more discussion directly on how to earn a high school diploma. And essentially, you earn a high school diploma by developing an individual curriculum. And that curriculum will, with our assistance, satisfy graduation requirements. That's the, that's the narrow expression of it. Obviously, it's going to take a little bit more time than that. Um, each child's course of study will be selected from a variety of courses, and uh, we'll be going over them in as much detail as possible. But these selections are based upon the child's needs and interests. And so it's, a, it's important to understand that the graduation requirements give us a structure of minimum coursework. But when we're looking at the fullness of the student and the opportunities available to the student, we're hoping that each individual student has a plan that is uh, broad and hopefully uh, broader than these minimum requirements. Uh, while we require, for example, 21 credits <coughs> to graduate minimum uh, in certain areas, uh, it's probably unrealistic to think that you can finish a homeschool high school diploma and take advantage of all the unique opportunities available to your son or daughter and taking into consideration some of their needs without having a lot more than 21 credits. And it's very uh, easy and very common for Walkersville students to have quite a few more credits than just 21. Down here in the bottom line, there's just a brief mention here of standard and applied courses. And I think the main thing I want to say at this point is an applied course is a course that's developed very specifically for your son or daughter in a specific area with, with uh, the kinds of activities and program that we approve based on the information that you give us. Uh, when we do a home visit, it's important that you understand our goal in a home visit is to ask you the question, now, what did we agree that you were going to do? Let me see it. <laughs> Let me see how you're doing that, okay? Now, 
uh, once in a while, and I'll, and I'll try to reiterate this maybe at least one more time, but once in a while we get into a home visit and we'll be looking at the agreement document, their course registration form that tells not only what the courses are but how they're going to be conducted. And you're allowed to check off standard course, which implies certain things, we'll get into that in a minute. And you check off a standard course, we sit down with you and start looking for standard work. And it's not there. And it's really funny because it actually still happens. You know, a mom will just look back and say, but I, but I thought we could sort of orientate this to our child's needs. I mean, I thought Walkersville was always like that. And you know, why are you expecting X, Y, Z? And I say, hope, oh, 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 oh. you're right and you're right, but you can't do two things at once. If you want to be treated with a special understanding, check the applied course and then you have to do a full presentation. What are you going to do? If you're not going to do what would be considered standard, what are you going to do? And we'll approve the course based upon that give and take. And so that's really the foundation. So um, I don't want to um, overstate something. The universal positive or negative can never be proven. But um, it does seem to me, as, I, as I've gone along over the years, Walkersville is one of the few programs that I've seen, it's actually the only one I've seen, that allows a parent to sit down, construct a meaningful course. We come alongside and say, well, for this credit in this discipline, that, you know, this is what you're going to do, and we organize the course uh, for you. So there's a lot of variety available. The bottom line is when you sign up for a course, we check that work that you signed up for. That's what a home visit does. And if you make a change to your course, all we ask is communication. I've changed it because this is what I want to do now instead, and we'll work that out. Um, concerning graduation requirements, here's the basic chart of it. Now, actually, in your book, there might be a little better looking chart um, than what you can see on the screen. It's a little bit squeezed. You, you actually have a chart that kind of breaks it out for you a little bit better than what's on the screen. But <clears throat> essentially, 21 credits to receive a high school diploma, 17 credits upon Aaron core courses, and four are from electives. Now there is a nuance for Walkersville, okay? With Maryland regulation, uh, Bible courses are understood to potentially be social studies courses or worked into some other type of coursework. So um, we do require Bible every year you're enrolled. And so uh, that does put a little bit of a cramp on your total course load. Uh, so you uh, either have to take more than 21 credits to get some additional work or you're going to use some of these Bible courses very specifically to get some um, credit area in, in another course as well. And I'll show you all about that in a minute. Um, so here's your basic structure and this is again current at this point in time. Um, as a standard rule of operation, whenever there's a change in the curriculum for a student graduating, uh, let's, let's say that we, that we were going to make a change. Um, we make it, for example, today for the incoming ninth graders and it's their diploma that's affected. But if, if you have, a, let's say, now we're not making any changes today, okay, just to not confuse you. But let's say that we were making a change and you have another son or daughter, say, in 10th grade or 11th grade, and you're saying, well, the, the graduation requirements changed. Well, the, the older student complies with the guidelines that they enrolled in 9th grade with. And those, those enrollment standards continue on to the... Um, uh, year of graduation. So any change we make is to the incoming freshman class. Now, this is a probably the most important definition about a high school credit for, for the Walkersville program that, that there is. Um, we have something that we're calling a Carnegie styled credit. Now a Carnegie credit, it's a Carnegie unit, basically 120 class hours. Uh, to equal a, a course in a, in a standard classroom. Well, we don't have a standard classroom and neither do we have standard hours in homeschool programs. So in order to try to take the simple idea of a Carnegie unit, 
transpose it onto a homeschool program. Uh, this is the definition that we've come up with. We have something called a QSU, a quality study unit. So instead of using an hour rate, an hour lecture rating, it's a qualified study unit. And if you have 120 QSUs or qualified study units, then you get a credit. Now, the thing that is frustrating to almost all homeschool moms, um, and probably all the fathers too, is the theoretical discussion of a QSU when it comes down to a particular course that you're taking. Uh, you know, sometimes you have you can mark in your student log the number of QSUs that you're that you accomplished in a particular day, and we'll try to go over that if we can. And some of the courses are a little more straightforward, and it, and you might feel a little frustrated. Well, why am I taking worrying about all the individual QSUs when I'm uh, specifically um, I know what I'm doing? And so I would like to say two quick things about the QSUs. Try to cooperate. <laughs> the, the importance of having a clear standard is that that's the only basis for us to be consistent. So that when we approve a, a course for you, if we approve it for a one credit course, the office is constantly establishing the standard of 120 QSUs. What does that mean? What does that look like? Um, we actually could take any course apart and divide it up into the individual single QSUs that equal that course. But when we organize it and plan it and present it and get, up, get functioning with it, you may not need to be thinking precisely in a QSU every minute of the day, uh, which is fine. But it's a, it's a necessary evil because uh, this is how you have a meaningful credit. It has to have some basic standard that doesn't change, and that's what this is. So um, essentially, if it's a standard course, it's spelled out in the standard course information. If it's an applied course, we sort of work out the agreement between us. But in the end, uh, the school regi registrar does reserve final say over what equals 120 QSUs for a particular course, or what equals 60 QSUs or whatever. So here I want to just point out the tension for a moment. You may not agree that uh, well, I think it's worth more than 60 QSUs. I, I think that's worth 120 QSUs. In fact, I think it's worth 200 or, or 240, you know. You might have a strong opinion of what, it, uh, of, of what the value is. Don't confuse the opinion of value with the understanding that we're going to let you do the type of courses that you feel called to do as a parent. So what that simply means is if, you, if you're presenting a course and you're doing something that we're not going to give you uh, the full credit for, the question isn't, did we nix your course? No, the question is, well, what would you have to do to get it up to the level of credit that you would like to have done? So we're talking about a negotiation process here where we make sure that the minimum amount of work has been accomplished in the course of establishing the course and then following it through. Um, now, I'm going to kind of go quickly through this area because it's not really going to affect you um, a whole lot unless you know that it affects you because you've already taken some courses and have eighth grade credit, seventh grade grade credit. Um, but this is part of standard policy. When you're in junior high, it's possible to take some high school level courses like Algebra One, and to have that check off, as it were, that that Algebra One course is completed so you don't have to take it again when you get in high school. Um, what, what happens is when you take a high school course in junior high and get credit for it, those credits don't go towards the 21 minimum credits to graduate. Those credits simply go on top of that. But it allows you to have a, a deeper academic curriculum during the course of your high school. So if you took Algebra One and Algebra Two in seventh and eighth grade, then you could start in your ninth grade year with trigonometry or advanced math or some other form of next level of math. So that's the intention of it. And again, just for your information, almost all of these policies that you're seeing literally are practical applications of the Maryland regulation back when we formed the school uh, 25 years ago. 
Um, here's the procedure, which of course is too late now for your eighth grader, but if you have other children coming along, <coughs> keep this in mind. Uh, you can get a high school credit if the courses are submitted under proper high school forms. Most of you have seen in your little pink junior high form booklet, there's a high school registration form or just standard junior high, and you, you have to make that choice and request a credit. We, we approve it and the course is on a high school level. Uh, early entrance into high school, again, this probably doesn't pertain to uh, any of you or many of you, but I'll just go ahead and make a, a simple statement. Um, if a child wants to skip seventh or eighth grade and, and go into high school early, in order to do that, they have to take the test that's going on right now to demonstrate they're, um, they're capable of doing high school work. And then the, the official mark of a ninth grader is that they're taking ninth grade level English in terms of, you know, so if you want to enter into high school early, then you're going to take remedial courses. Um, we're not talking the same language here. <clears throat> early graduation, um, yes, the, um, the policy of the school is to permit students to graduate early, not, not necessarily having a full four-year program. So you can use an accelerated 21 credit program or you can use some other form of job entry, uh, early admission to a post-secondary college, what have you, as a means of graduating early. Um, my concern here that I would just like to share uh, practically is that when you are making a decision to bump your child up, it's important that you think it through. Why am I doing this? What's the purpose? Because there have been a couple occasions where even with a little bit of um, gentle uh, warning about the possible fallout, um, parents you know, make the decision to graduate their child early and then all of a sudden have a really young child that is um, not really ready to go on to the next step, but now they're not quite sure what they're going to do at, at this step. So just make that decision prayerfully, but the program supports early entrance and early graduation as well. Um, transfer students, this doesn't really pertain to you, but we do have a, a little bit of a, a change in uh, basically the, um, the courses have to have a minimal conformity uh, and the courses have to have a minimal achievement level and uh, there's also a, a problem with Bible but we'll talk about that later in another section. Now here's where the work begins for parents and students regarding their um, selecting for their course credit. Um, you're required to earn 21 credits to graduate and those credits have to be within the selected disciplines, that, those minimum disciplines. So obviously if you take more credits outside of a discipline then you're going to have more credits to graduate because you have to have a minimum of 21 credits in the minimum disciplines listed which we showed earlier. So <clears throat> in order to help that along the process we are recognizing that uh, homeschooling offers some unique opportunities and this is where we really get into the discussion of standard courses and applied courses which we'll get into a little bit more detail in a minute. Um, so basically this is what we're going to do. Um, <clears throat> let me read this because this is sort of an application of the understanding of what a credit is. All WSFS approved courses <coughs> will earn credit based upon the Carnegie system stated in section two, takes a minimum of 120 QSUs to equal one credit. In every case, whether the course is considered standard or applied, a QSU is the implementation of an approved study method which covers a comparable amount of course content that would normally be covered during a one hour traditional classroom instruction. Now that means a lot to me and it just might be gibberish to you. But essentially, that's how we move from a traditional classroom where we're dealing with standard lectures by a teacher and how we measure that in a homeschool setting when you don't have any lecture perhaps at all. And you know, so we're, so we're going by not the hour, but the amount of content that you're gonna cover that would be sort of normal or similar to an hour lecture. But then also, you have a study method that is approved. So essentially that's how QSU is developed. What's the content and how are you going to go over that content in a meaningful way? 
So there are several mechanisms for that, and we'll get into that now. Following sections describe the standard courses and applied courses and other considerations for selecting or developing specific courses. Um, let me see. I'm trying to keep track of two sets of notes and I'm getting behind. Um, <clears throat> I think that I'm confused where I am. Okay, here we are. All right. <clears throat> this is probably, this, this is the most un misunderstood chart in Walkersville. <laughs> this is going to appear under applied courses with a modified understanding and you get the two confused, okay? So let me explain. This is basically the description for credits as it relates to QSUs, 120. QSUs is one, half of that of course is 60, that gets you half a credit. A third of that is 40, that'll get you a third credit and 30 QSUs is equal to a quarter credit. So that's basically how we measure whether a course is worth a half a credit or a quarter credit or a whole credit. Now, you can get non-traditional credits and again, this is, um, part, part of this actually is right out of the regulation, um, but there are many ways to construct and get that particular QSU. So don't ever assume that uh, you get on this one track, I'm going to do X, Y, Z, and nothing else applies. There are many different options to keep that in the back of your mind. And applied courses are, are, are one of the mechanisms for helping you have a variety of, of academic approach suitable for a home instruction program. Now. What's important at this point, if I can just sort of reiterate the structure, <clears throat> if you understand what standard is, then you know what to vary from. Okay, an applied course varies something that a standard course has. So it kind of makes a little change. Well, I'm not going to do this. Standard course will do this. But I'm not going to do this. I'd like to do this instead. So. If you start with standard and you understand it, then your applied courses are simply courses with other options chosen that aren't listed in the standard course. Uh, it is important to understand that as I describe the nature of a standard course, uh, there's, there's a, a, a basically four primary study methods useful for a standard course. Those study methods are interchangeable and one of the aspects of the high school QSU log for students is those, those four interchangeable methods are able to be marked on the QSU log to keep track. Um, if I could give my preference, I would like you to sample, I, I, I would recommend that your students sample all four standard study techniques regardless if you predominantly like to do a lot of applied courses, still encourage you to get those four study mechanisms in there because these study mechanisms actually make students independent learners and they're, they're critical for um, how a student might perform later in a college classroom, et cetera, if they've picked up some of these skills. Well, let's go through the details here. Um, number one, a standard course consists of required content and approved study methods. Okay, we've already established that. That's, how a, that's, that's the definition of a QSU. Approved study methods and required content. Students are required to keep all work and records in a student portfolio, okay? Basically, we're the inspectors. We're, we're like a third party validator that this course that we described was done in a, minimal, a minimally reasonable fashion. And uh, the, probably the only reason why we have Navy approval as a tier one school is because we have such a clear mechanism for evaluating an individual student's work. And that, that's essentially what the uh, the armed services want. It's an outside party saying, yeah, this was actually legitimate high school work done in a legitimate fashion. So um, our goal is to establish the standard, what are you supposed to do, and then when we have a home visit, we're just checking over to see what you're doing and are you keeping up to that standard. That's why you have to keep a student portfolio. The simplest definition of a portfolio is a record of the things I said I was going to do. 
so I can prove that I did them. That's essentially what a portfolio is. Whatever you need to demonstrate that you complied with the mechanisms of study that you signed up for, that's what you're gonna show, okay? So therefore, if you have um, checked off, well, I did outline method. Great, that's a wonderful study method. It's standard approved. I wanna see your outlines. Well, I did it in my head. Well, that's great. That's called a mental outline. Can I open your head and look in? <laughs> okay, for a third party review to take place, we have to be able to look at something that you said you did and be able to say, yeah, that, yeah, you did it. Or, or you know, I, I, you call this an outline and <clears throat> I hate to be the one to inform you, but this really isn't an outline. And uh, so I'll give you a quick lesson and then you can start over. You know, that's a frightening thing to happen in November, you know. Start over. <laughs> but it might need to be that way. So let's look at the required content here. Required course content. A standard course is any course that implements specific reading assignments from a, an approved textbook, and it covers that content using one of the approved study methods below. One half of a course's QSU come from reading 70%, that's the minimum, okay, 70% of the approved text. The other half comes from fulfilling the requirements for the student portfolio. Now, does that make sense to you? Okay, essentially what we're saying is always a portion of the work is going to be reading an approved textbook when we're dealing with a standard course, okay? And many applied courses will also have that as a part of it also. Now, there are several approved study methods. Let me go through them. I probably should have listed them uh, numerically. The method of instruction for a standard course can be taken from the following list of approved study methods. Any method other than those listed below must be submitted to the registrar for special approval. That's when you apply for an applied course credit and use the proper forms for that. You may request a list of approved textbooks if you're not sure of books that we have pre-approved. Essentially, we approve textbooks that are standard in terms of industry standards, um, and we don't really have a whole lot of trouble. Probably the biggest trouble that we get into is there are a lot of homeschool um, textbooks that are on the market for homeschoolers, and many times the uniqueness of the textbook and the approach to which they use comes off at a little different um, volume of information, and so if we haven't ever heard of the book before, we're gonna to wanna to be able to review it for the substance of its content. So where appropriate, the following study methods are approved and interchangeable when they're performed in the manner prescribed in the student por and when the student portfolio contains them in chronological order. Now what that means simply is by interchangeable, that means you don't have to get permission to switch. And if you're doing an outline method one day and the next day you want to do an oral lecture method, do it. Just keep track of it. And I would like to suggest that um, the purpose of the QSU log primarily is an instrument for the student to recognize personal responsibility for the work that they're doing in their courses and it enables them to keep track of things as it goes along. Um, this is a part of the home visit review it's also a part of portfolio requirements in some cases, mandatory. If there's any course that requires a QSU log, then it needs to appear on our log unless you have devised a log that has been pre-approved by the school. Um, for your information, this log will do 10 courses. Um, we do have single course QSU logs that are available. Um, but I recommend using this particular. One of the nice things about this QSU log is that it takes all of today's lecture, its most important highlights, it reduces it to one page, isn't that nice? And so it gives you the highlights of what you're looking for and why you're looking for it and how you get there. <clears throat> now, let's go to the next point then. When approved by the registrar on a prescribed form, the credit may be earned for activities other than those designated for standard courses. What that basically is saying, again, um, wait a minute. I am missing something, excuse me. Okay, I have to back up. 
I thought I did such a wonderful job making 80 slides, but I've missed some slides I didn't make, so I'm going to get way ahead of myself <laughs> and be in uh, Lulu land, okay? Um, first of all, let me find where you are in your book so you know where you are. Um, page 14 is where we're located in your notebook, okay? And I apologize, but I don't have slides for this little segment here. The, um, this particular section is the most important part, so I'm sorry I didn't make slides for it. It was a real big mistake. But um, it's also found in the front of your book. That's of the QSU log for your information. <clears throat> there are four pre-approved study methods for the standard course. And the approved study methods are as follows. Um, I apologize for the numbering system. It sounds kind of difficult, but I'm just trying to organize paragraphs. <clears throat> 3.4.1, the review question and unit test method. Review question and unit test method. Originally, this was the only standard course mechanism that we had, but I, I realized that we were approving other types of study on a regular basis, and I realized we could just include all of them in a standard course description. Essentially here then with the review question text, basically you're reading the text, you're answering the, the required number of questions at the end of each chapter or section, and then you're taking a test over the content when you finish the unit. The student portfolio then will contain uh, the schedule of the content to be covered for the year and a uh, record of the pages read with the parents' initials. Now here's where you have a little asterisk concerning the QSU log. If you're, if you're doing um, any of these standard mechanisms concerning reading of the text, we would prefer that you write the reading record on your QSU log. That's what we would prefer. However, it, you can use your portfolio, and if today's assignment I'm answering the questions on page 26, um, then at the top of the page, read pages 1 to 26, you know, and we put the date down, um, the parents initial it and then you answer the question. So you can incorporate a reading log right into your daily work uh, if you choose to do that. So the record of the page is read, and then a complete set of the review questions that are dated and kept in your notebook. Now again, pay attention to the standard. If you're going to interchange the study methods, which you may, um, my desire is that you keep the student work in chronological order. So if you're doing an outline this week, there's your outline for this week, and this week's date is in sequence with the other weeks. Next week, if you're switching over to the unit review method, method then you just simply conform, switch it over so it's, it's listed as it is. So, so you don't have to keep one section for one item and one section for another. The second approved method is called the detailed outline. It's also on page 15. Detailed outline and unit test method. Now, what you basically do is read the text and then create a detailed outline of each chapter study, taking the unit test as well. The student portfolio will again show the content to be covered, the record of the pages read, and also a complete set of chapter outlines. I would like to mention briefly, uh, excuse me, and all the unit tests taken. Uh, I would like to mention briefly that, um, first of all, any variable of one of these standard methods can be approved. You just need to approve it. So if you want to do something a little different than the specific element there, that's what you use an applied course for. But an applied course would just create a variable of either one or more of the standard study methods. Uh, and that's actually the best way to sort of begin getting a feel for standard, excuse me, for applied courses. The other thing that I wanted to say about um, these particular standard study methods, um, it totally left my mind, so hopefully I'll remember it later. We'll keep on going. Chapter review. The third study method here is the, oh, excuse me, I remembered it now, I'm gonna bring it back up. In the outline method, um, I really would like to encourage you to use that method with, with your student uh, on at least um, a limited occasion. Um, it is a significant method. Basically, it's forcing the student to take something that's put together and an outline makes them take it apart. What's well, the taking apart of that material that puts them through the necessity of figuring out what the logic grid was of the author. Well, when you can figure out the logic grid of an author, 
then you've gone a long way in beginning to master the whole process of, of conceptual ideas, how they're structured and organized. And as you put them into that structure and organize them yourself, that material begins to be uh, logical to you and you actually learn an enormous amount. Uh, that's probably my favorite method because it has such a power behind it. <clears throat> going on, the chapter summary method. Again, you're going to read the text, but then at the end of the segment or a section, instead of doing an outline or just answering questions, the student will actually write an essay, 300 to 400 word uh, summary report of the chapter studied, and then you're going to take unit tests. Um, the, the essential difference between an outline method and the essay, uh, essentially the outline method is extremely detailed and it covers the full logic of it. Uh, the essay mechanism uh, varies. Some students do a good job with, with the essay and some students tend to um, get a little bit superficial. So I would encourage you to interchange outline and essays and pay attention to the quality of student work because, again, both of these are really, really valuable tools for homeschool students if they do them well. Um, I do not want to um, underestimate the significance of how useful these tools are for students, especially in a home taught environment. <clears throat> Concerning the portfolio for chapter summary, um, you're going to, again, have the content, schedule the record of pages read, and you're going to have a complete set of the detailed essays kept in your notebook. Again, on all the tests that you've taken will also be in your notebook. Next point, fourth area. Fourth area is going to be the read aloud lecture and unit test method. Now, this, this method is the only one that doesn't have a lot of writing to demonstrate. And so this method is absolutely necessary to incorporate into a QSU log so that you exactly have in your record what you covered that day, how much time you spent covering it, and the nature of the discussion. Um, you read the text out loud with an adult tutor, that's the preferred element. Uh, review all questions orally and uh, vocabulary orally with the tutor <coughs> to ensure comprehension, and then you take the unit test. Now, the chief item then for review is notice the portfolio has a completed QSU log showing a record of pages read um, besides the unit tests and the schedule that's being covered. So um, now there's a, there's a temptation here, probably on your part, to say, well, um, you know, this sounds too hard. I mean, I don't have the time to sit down and, and read with my student. You know, I've got a lot of, a lot of students that I'm dealing with. <clears throat> a couple things that I encourage you. Please, if you're going to do the read aloud lecture, always include the whole family in it. Take your oldest child and deal with them and include everybody else because it's a tremendous, it's probably the most powerful tool of all the learning methods. And I'll tell you a little interesting story that I heard from Bob Jones years ago um, concerning um, this, this particular method. Um, there have been programs called PACE programs. And a lot of Christian schools have used them, especially when they have very low budget, they can't really afford a lot of teachers, they don't have a lot of students, and so to manage all 12 grades or whatever, uh, some, some publishing companies have come up with educational material that's produced uh, in what they've called a PACE. You have 10 or more PACEs, Alpha Omega's an example of them, there's some others out there as well. And so what happened um, in these classroom settings Basically, the teacher would be um, a moderator. And if it was a really big classroom, it might be almost this big, but all through the room, there's these little individual study cubicles where each student's able to sit at work and do the, do the work that that student's doing. There's not necessarily any bell ringing going on. The student um, does different courses at different times um, on their own, one by one. Um, Bob Jones always reviews the incoming freshmen on a periodic basis. They, they um, are always looking for just comparisons of the type of student that does well in their, in their academic environment. So at this particular time that uh, the story I'm telling you about, homeschooling hadn't really been going on for more than a couple of years. So the, the Bob Jones 
evaluation went along the lines of comparing public school, Christian school in a traditional sense, and then these Christian schools that were these PACE programs. And they were astonished that the Christian school students from the PACE programs were the lowest um, performing students when they entered into freshman in college. They couldn't handle the classroom environment, they couldn't handle content, and it was, um, and they thought it was kind of remarkable because the textbooks were uh, pretty significant textbooks, et cetera. And so they did a little bit exploring and they, and they, they, they believed that their particular reason for even the public school students doing better than these Christian school students taking the pace, but the, the biggest reason was probably the fact that uh, students need a little bit of auditory conceptualization to get that material in in a, in a window that's a, a little more permanent for the nature of the student. And if a child's just continuously looking at information on a paper, writing a response to that information, and going on, which the pace is sort of were on that basis, um, the capacity to retain that information is um, potentially very significantly low. <clears throat> I thought that was an interesting report because just prior to that, a couple of years before that, <clears throat> I had, uh, I've been teaching school for 10 years in a Christian school, more traditional method in, in all 10 years. Um, however, in this 10th year, I guess I was getting more relaxed and more explorative, and so I decided to try something which I called the read aloud lecture. And um, I, I used this method um, with my um, eighth grade students. And what I wanted to do is just test the power of the method. I didn't want to um, you know, necessarily prejudice myself in any way or cause the students to panic that I was being unreasonable. So I, I essentially said to the students, okay, today you're not allowed to take notes. Put your pens away, put your notebooks away. All you're allowed to have out is your textbook. Get your textbook out. There's no writing. And I want you to understand there's not gonna be any test on this material and th that'll affect your grade. Um, and so let's relax. I wanna have a classroom read aloud time. So we took the chapter and we read it aloud. Had each you know, of the students stand up and read a little paragraph. We discussed it and you know, went through the whole chapter. <clears throat> then um, for homework, I said, you have no homework. You, know, you, will, you will not have a test. Now that was a lie. <laughs> it was a lie in that when they came in the next day, I gave them an exam on the chapter. <laughs> But it wasn't the lie in that, I, I didn't, it wasn't a test that, they were, that was gonna count. It was just an exploratory, you know, when I gave the test the next day, I said, this isn't a real test, this is just a curiosity of mine. I wanted to see how much material you remember using that method we used yesterday where you didn't take any notes, we just had interaction over the material. So I, I gave them a test and I think I gave a fair test. I mean, I, I always was a good hard test giver. My idea of giving a test was if you put an answer, if you put a question on the students ans can answer, then that was a dumb question to put down. Put down a question that you're pretty sure they can't answer. <laughs> that tests how smart the kid is. <laughs> well anyway, uh, I got away from that after a few years, but anyway, <laughs> actually after a few weeks of my <laughs> principal was ready to fire me. <laughs> but um, so I gave the test the next day and astonishing thing was I got the highest set of test scores from that group of students. I've, I've been having them all year, I had them for two years. And I got the highest set of test scores I'd ever gotten anywhere. And it was just, it was later when I read the Bob Jones review and I thought, you know, that's an interesting thing. But communication, talking, reading, discussion, that's a significant mechanism for learning. And so it's incorporated into one of our four standard study methods uh, for the program actually I have no idea why I just put this away. But let me see, where are we? Okay, so those are the four methods. I'll give them the real quick review. Review question, detailed outline, chapter summary, and the read aloud lecture. Um, now, I will make one little comment here, and that is um, essentially for an applied course, what an applied course does is it substitutes some kind of a project a hands-on type project um, for one of these other activities. And the project is broadly defined in any kind of an activity that has meaningful educational value. We like the project to 
be focused on the particular uh, area of study. But I, I, here's a little thing to put in your notebook somewhere. I approve as a standard um, practice the, the periodic singular use of an hour-long project when it's, on, when it's on topic, when it's on target. Okay, so if you're doing a standard course and you uh, come upon a particular project that you could do in that particular course area and you add that project to it, it gets acknowledged as a part of the standard course. Um, where you have to have the course approved is when you have a substantial project. And so when we get to the definitions here, um, going on here, applied course defined. Um, hopefully you're writing all your questions down. And I'm sorry that I'm going so lickety split. Applied course defined when approved by the registrar on the prescribed form of credit maybe you're in for activities and programs other than those designated for standard courses. The following material represents policies and procedures for creating, approving, and validating applied courses. An applied course consists of required content, approved study methods. Students must submit requests on the applied course description form and they're required to keep all their work and records in a student portfolio. Required course content for an applied course is the following. Any course that implements a project or real life experience as a major instructional component. Now, that's a legal definition, I'm sorry, and in the end, I get to interpret it. <laughs> but what that means is um, a minor uh, application, a minor project that would last about an hour, you can use those projects in among the standard courses as long as it doesn't accumulate to be a major part of the student grade. The terminology here is major instructional component. So um, I hope you can understand what that means from a practical standpoint. Most moms appear when they do this on occasion, appear to have a good handle of on occasion a specific project that they're throwing in there and that's not a problem. Uh, and you don't have to have an applied course to do a couple special projects. It's when the amount of applied projects that you're using sort of rises to this level of a, becoming a major component, that's when we want to uh, approve it because it's a, it's, a, it's a significant part of the course and a part of the course grade. Um, except we're approved otherwise, we're still wanting you to use 70% reading of an approved text as half of your QSUs and then your project is going to equal the other 60 QSUs. Now, um, just a quick word about that. Let me back up here so I don't get you confused. Um, again, that's taking the simplest view of an applied course possible. An applied course is taking a standard course and tweaking it with projects in a meaningful way. Um, I do need to reiterate, and you need to make a little marginal note here. It is possible that you might have a particular kind of course that would not have any textbook per se at all, and it will still be approved as a full credit course, okay? You don't have to have a textbook for every applied course. But what's important to understand is most of the time, it's realistic to have a textbook. That, that gives you some place to start from. And if you think of it that way, I'm starting from a place of kind of standard understanding and then I'm moving towards some specialty application that makes it a little simpler. Um, one of the biggest desires that I've had over the years is to try to expand the use of applied courses. And the only way that I really could see to do that is to help make everybody understand that basically an applied course is a standard course with some meaningful tweaks relating to the particular nature of the subject matter and the student and student opportunities that were available for it. So uh, it is possible, for example, to <coughs> get um, a full credit business math course, for example, if you have a business that you're going to be conducting and keeping the books for that business in a, in a proper professional fashion. And you would be therefore most likely having a business math textbook available to give you the necessary instruction and what have you, but but the amount of that textbook that you were going to be using would be varied based upon specific tasks of your business course. But again, those things have to be individually presented and approved. 
The approved study methods, basically, when the textbook is involved, you'll be reading the text and you'll perform your scheduled projects, labs, or whatever activity has been agreed upon. And then you'll produce a written account of projects or activities in the form of either an observation note journal or a three to five page paper per project or activity. And these will be entered into the expo. Now, with respects to um, what we're talking about, here's basically what I want to explain in a, in a simple fashion. If you're doing an applied course, that you're using some type of a project that's, that's of a more major component, then that activity is gonna be part of it that the child's gonna be doing, but then we're gonna want them to have some reflection on the activity, and so the three to five page report um, gets to be a part of that component for them to digest what they're doing. There are occasions when that three to five page paper isn't necessarily uh, going to be required, but again, that's on the individual request because of the particular nature of the course and the other things that the student's doing, okay? Proof study methods continued. Students shall participate in a meaningful activity, a work practicum, or will complete a project that is related to the subject's content area. Study activities may also include, but are not restricted to, the proof study methods listed for standard courses. Uh, what that basically means is uh, you can modify, uh, instead of having 60 QSUs of applied activity, you might have 30 or, or 20, but you're still going to be, you'll still be a major component, and you might have other techniques that are still being used under the standard basis. However, if you're mixing a major component of a project with your standard activities, then it all needs to find its way onto an applied course form for approval. <clears throat> Continuing, a student portfolio will contain the following items, copy of the approved description, record of the pages read, um, if a QSU log is not required, otherwise that would be in the QSU log, and a journal of all the entries written or prescribed, dated and kept in a notebook. Uh, usually a QSU log is required uh, there are occasions, though, that the nature of the project is such that you're producing some form of a written product, document, whatever, and that's sufficient for keeping track of your reading and demonstrating completion of the course. Again, here's where we get into trouble. I already showed you another page of what a QSU equals. <laughs> and now here we're mixing in something called clock hours. And this does confuse people. Um, again, sometimes, there are courses, and the specific applied course component, one of the requisites of that applied course is so many hours spent in doing some kind of a work practicum or what have you, okay? So when the course spells it out that part of the requisite is so many hours doing a certain kind of an activity, whether it be phys ed, typing, could be um, your work study, et cetera. When you have a time component that's tied into the applied course, then we do have a comparison of one hour, one clock hour equals 120 QSUs. Now, let me explain though, um, this is not a general application. And, and sometimes it just, because we allow for it where it's needed, some people just accidentally cross it over and think that, well, an hour of anything gives me a QSU. Uh, and the essential foundation for a QSU is approve content, approved study method. That's the essential definition. So when the approved study method is necessarily measured in hours, then the hours pertain to that. But when the approved study method doesn't pertain to hours, then it's not going to be associated with it. Probably the simplest way to explain it is um, math. Homeschoolers are notorious for notoriously slow getting through some of their math courses. Um, algebra one is algebra one, whether you spend 100 hours on it or 795 hours on it. When you're done, you have algebra one. Thank you very much. So again, we're not. That, that, that's the clarity of the nature of the course. It, it's it's actually happened where people think, well, I got a credit because I spent 120 hours on the first page of my algebra book. <laughs> yeah, that, doesn't that count? <laughs> um, 
Let me see, earning college credit. <clears throat> this is an important thing for some of you to consider. Uh, not necessarily for your freshman year, but, but as you go along, uh, and maybe by your 11th grade year. Um, there is opportunity to, to take high school courses that kind of double up as um, potential college credit as well. There's something called the CLEP system, and there's also the local community college. Um, it's my opinion that when a student can, due to the, the, the level of their academic material, when they can uh, take a substantive course and complete it thoroughly, uh, you can basically take CLEP exams um, at the prescribed times available uh, when you've completed a particular course of study, but you have to keep this in mind as you're going along. First of all, for a CLEP exam, my, my suggestion is to try to do 100% of the textbook to master it, and then be specifically careful which particular kind of textbook that you're using, because sometimes a particular textbook may not quite have the, the level, the depth of academic information that a CLEP test. Basically, what you do when you get a CLEP test is you you clep out of a college level course, meaning that the level of information you mastered in high school was equal to the standard level of information presented at the college level. And so when you complete a high school level course at the level of a college credit, you can clep that course and then you actually get a credit to um, go on your college transcript uh, when you enter into college. And so um, while I'm not prepared to go into it in more detail, it's something that is um, certainly a viable option and might be a real positive encouraging option too because I found one of the things that really does encourage homeschool students in their latter part of their high school years that this, this is kind of an observation. But as they start seeing that their work is counting toward college, there's that sense of, it, of oh, I can achieve this, I can do this, and it sort of gives them a little bit more of, of an incentive as well as an edge in the process of doing their best. Uh, it's important to note that we don't make the determination as to whether a college or a university will even accept a CLEP course. Um, the, um, that's basically done. You take the, the CLEP test as a part of the, um, the test at College Board of Princeton and uh, you, know, you get a CLEP credit, then the colleges that accept CLEP credit will accept it. Not every college does. Um, now, I would like to move on to some understanding of how to use your electives to make a more individualized course of study. And um, I've gotten way behind on my other notes here. Why do you have electives? The number one reason for having electives is so that you can vary your individual students' high school course of study to meet their individual needs as much as possible. So uh, electives are a component for doing that. Um, obviously, with us requiring four Bible credits, we sort of gobbled up four of the electives. Um, you, you really have four electives available for mixing and matching the particular needs of the student. And again, I mentioned to you earlier that if you're looking to do a college prep type of course of study, uh, you need to give that consideration because um, often a college uh, prep course of study requires uh, three to four social studies, three to four sciences, three to four maths, and that, that sort of takes the credits in a certain direction. Many colleges also require two foreign language credits, uh, which is on this page here, down here at the, at the bottom. So basically, you have four electives, but you have a whole lot more of, op of opportunities and options that you might want to be considering. Um, <clears throat> here's a rule I'd like to, you to impose on yourself just as a way of process. <clears throat> Always think in terms of organizing everything you do in your family life through the venue of the high school diploma program. And here's why. Um, when you don't do that, then you have competition in your home based on values. And it's, it's kind of difficult. Most, most of us aren't equipped to face two decisions. 
one decision has a value, this is for my credit to graduate, and this is just something I'm doing. And we, we tend to, uh, on, in a more natural sense of the word, take the priority of what seems to be valuable and constructive and let go of the things that uh, don't have that same bearing. Well, if we're really homeschooling, then we're recognizing that we actually have children 24 hours a day. In a 24-hour day period outside of sleeping, we don't have college credit, I mean high school credit for sleeping, but outside of that, um, anything that you're doing that is constructive and useful, that can be organized and developed into part of the academic program. If you would take an approach that everything that I'm doing in the course of a day is a part of the academic program, you'll get a little more balance for yourself. You'll, you'll end up with a lot more credits than you need per se, but you will also change an attitude, especially in the child, as to how valuable certain activities are as you're looking at them and saying, oh, well, this is, this is an important thing that I'm doing. It has value. And so you begin constructing courses that are particularly out of the net set of circumstances that you have as a family. What that often does is it allows you to recognize the unique circumstances in your home that your family addresses together that, that, that your children participate in and they incorporate that into the larger academic program. So it, there really isn't that much that you can't organize as a college, excuse me, as a high school credit. So a question that I have some people ask, well isn't that meddling? That is Walkersville meddling too much in your personal affairs so that everything is reviewed by us. Well that's not what I was thinking about <laughs> when I was imagining it. What I'm imagining is the benefit of organizing things, if it's worth doing, do it. There's, a, there's another day of judgment coming, as it were, accountability, where we're going to give an account for the things done in the body. Everything's going to be included, probably including sleep, but anyway, everything's going to be included. And it's a good idea to recognize that, hey, if we're doing things that are legal and we can stand before the Lord and say, this is the right thing to do, then just organize it into the total spectrum of the family. <clears throat> I have found, which is why I spend a little time emphasizing it every year, I have found that um, many parents find themselves uh, relieved once they realize that they can orchestrate their home school program to incorporate the entirety of the home. And all of a sudden, uh, they can incorporate things like cooking, grocery planning, house cleaning, all these things get focused into you know, what a homeschool program is, and uh, it's actually useful. Now, I have an advantage in terms of thinking this way, because I happened to go to high school at a boarding school. And everything we did, from the time the bell rang in the morning at 6 o'clock till we were in bed at 9.30 at night, 100% of the day was orchestrated, planned, determined efforts to train us and get us to do stuff, et cetera. Well, I can look at that and say, oh, and that's cool. Yeah, we cleaned the, the premise. We had day, morning chores, evening chores. <laughs> we had athletics. We had classes. We, we had, you know, all kinds of things incorporated into the day. And everything was deliberate. So I realized, well, that's really what education is. I was homeschooled and didn't realize I just had a big family. <laughs> okay, individual emphasis. I want to talk a little bit about Bible courses. And, and, um, and waivers, okay? This is the most complicated part of the whole presentation. Basically, let me summarize it in, in a preview sentence. Since we require you to take four Bible courses, the nature of the Maryland regulations clarified that Bible courses can be used in uh, more than one course department. So you can use, for example, a Bible course as a Bible course or religion course directly, or you can use it as a part of a sociology program or, or, a, or a history program. You could use it and incorporate it into some kind of a grammar or English program. So the possibility exists with 21 credits, a limited amount of student time available for activities, what have you. Well, Walkersville does have it organized so that students may use the Bible to satisfy English, social studies, or science course requirements. It has to have the approved Bible theme 
to satisfy the content requirement for the other courses. And it says a student can waive no more than two Bible credits. Now here's what we're talking about. We're talking about waiving the Bible credit. Instead of getting a Bible credit, you get a Bible checkoff. Okay? You have to have Bible four years in a row. But two of those four years, you can get a checkoff. That you, you did um, Bible as history, or Bible as English, or Bible as science, and you got a checkoff. You got credit for having done Bible that year. You don't get a Bible credit, because you're going to get the credit in English, or science, or, or history. So that's a st this is the standard policy, and uh, it's, uh, it's in conformity to the, Mer to the Maryland regulations. And uh, I don't think that it's as difficult now as it used to be. I used to have nightmares trying to explain this to moms. You know, how in the world can we you know, get a, a credit check off when we didn't get a credit? And we did take Bible, and, but it's just a matter of adjusting. You can take Bible as another course and get a Bible check off. Um, concerning also uh, the individual emphasis here, uh, you can take more than 21 credits. I've already emphasized that. Um, my suggestion is relax. Everything that you do that's of any value, that's part of your homeschool program, recognize it, incorporate it, balance it, and give credit for it. I mean, you're doing stuff, literally, you're doing it all, all year long. Not only is it all day long, and all week long, but it's all year long. So there are many, many other areas to get credit. And why do people not do it? Uh, I think basically the main reason people don't take additional credit like this is for somehow they don't quite see the vision and the value of recognizing the whole day is my obligation to give an answer to the Lord for. Let me make sure the whole day is organized and developed. Uh, and so all they see is more work. I've got to write it down in the QSU log. Oh, I'm sick and tired of work. Let me, let me get, get rid of uh, reporting forms. <laughs> so that's probably the number one reason people don't do it. So you can take more than 21 credits. Here's a little suggestion, especially for ninth and 10th grade work. Take your core courses first. Um, there are courses that are more fun that relate to um, opportunities such as your electives and your work study and your Christian service, et cetera. But um, if possible, try to rotate those or roll those back a little bit to the last half. One of the benefits is when you have your core courses out of the way, what happens in your 11th, 12th grade year, you get options and opportunities that come up. And if you're uh, finished with some of your primary work, uh, your ability, you, you might be able to have a driver's license by then, and you can take advantage of unusual opportunities uh, if you've already got some of those basic courses out of the way. I will say, though, that in many, many cases, <laughs> we're um, finding students trying to finish up their first year of math by their 12th grade year, which is, um, a little bit slow, a little bit behind. How to register your courses. Now this is pretty much something that you're all familiar with. Essentially, you use the forms we provide. Um, one thing that has a little special note, if you were enrolled in the school and did not register a course and would like to apply for credit later, you may apply with proper documentation. However, final approval is sole judgment of the registrar. Let, let me just explain that, okay? We want you not to be disappointed. Disappointment is you have an expectation. You thought, oh, I was going to get a credit for this. And then you don't get a credit for it because we didn't think it was sufficient for a full credit. Maybe we're only going to give you a half a credit or whatever. So our goal is to avoid disappointment. So that's why we ask you to please get all your courses pre-approved up front. However, especially with many uh, uh, daily routines and special opportunities that go on in the summer, many times your student will get involved in something and when we find out about it at a home visit we'll say well why don't you register that as a course that's a great course I'd like to, that would really be good on your transcript just as a broad experience and well you say well i thought if we didn't have it pre-approved it couldn't we couldn't get credit for it the bottom line is we always can back approve something as long as you have all the documentation and whatever we decide to give it is the final judgment but um, uh, we encourage you to try to make the most of things and not be stymied as you go along thinking that um, you know, we won't work with you. you know, I, I think our biggest goal is to make a credit be a credit every time you look at a credit. So that's the consistency. And uh, yet on the other side of the coin, we want every activity 
and, and valuable experience a child's getting to be considered credit worthy and to have that included in their portfolio for um, uh, their, their final transcript. Um, second point here, each applied course must be submitted for approval using the proper form. Um, be sure to apply all the elective credit to internships. There's a little comment about forms here, okay? Work studies, Christian services, those, both of those are separate forms and you use those specific forms exp expressly for Christian service and work study. When you have an applied course, don't try to take an applied course form and fill out a work study form on it, that's not going to help. And don't try to take a <coughs> work study form and fill out an applied course. You know, use the forms for what they're intended. Um, I think I'll mention it later, but in case I don't. We do have a small legal obligation when it comes to any student activity that could be characterized as child labor. And Maryland and federal law simply signifies that when a child is enrolled in a bona fide work study program, that work that they're doing in the work study program is counted as academic work, not child labor. So we have specific requisites of what students must take for work study and Christian service. That's exclusively a part of the academic uh, course of study and none of that work goes on a child's um, child labor requirements. So uh, you know, let's say that they want to work at McDonald's at the end of the day. All of their work hours are available even though they're doing a work study. But using the right forms is important for, for communication across the board. Um, we do have the reporting forms booklet. There's a couple, couple in the back if you need to look at one. But we also have them on the internet uh, which you each have a membership card for accessing the web page. Um, I did mention earlier that in the center of this particular high school handbook there is a blank fill in the blank course planner for each student. It is our desire that you would have one book per student so that you can utilize the planning system for each student. Suggestion, use pencil. Things change. <clears throat> um, now, I have a quick question. What time is it? 10, at, 10 after 11. 10 after 11? Okay. Um, I'll try to speed up here. Okay. All right. Well, why don't we just, do you want to, let's change the tape now because we're at a break point. Why don't you all just take a quick stand break, stand up break. Ready? Okay. We're going to continue now. Um, what we're going to do now is just, just cover some of the course areas with a brief description, a description of some of the course requirements. Uh, basically every course approved for credit, again, it consists of required content and approved study methods, which you keep archived in a student portfolio. So those three elements are always a part of everything that you do. In fact, you probably have the uh, applied course form memorized by now if you used it before because those are the three things that are on it. What are you going to do? How are you going to do it? What are you going to show me to show me that you did it? Those are the three parts of the program. So um, standard courses derive their content from an approved textbook uh, as well as the study methods already discussed in section two. <coughs> Applied courses derive their content from approved textbook or otherwise as stated on the course description form. Uh, besides reading the textbook, you also can do projects that are approved from real life experiences, et cetera. Um, again, these are some just general guidelines that are in the book. What I would like to do is go through the basic discipline areas real briefly just for highlighting. Bible disciplines, we require four credits or two credits and two checkoffs. Uh, Bible credit every year that you're enrolled in the school. Um, the content, it's required every year. Uh, two credits can be waived. If you're a transfer student, which doesn't relate to you all, um, then you have to have a minimum of one credit per year that you're enrolled in the school program. Uh, and we have many Bible study text programs that are acceptable. Um, I will make a personal comment about Bible. Um, it's the one course that if at all possible, we don't want it reduced to a course. That sounds like a contradiction, I know. But the Bible is living, it's a living word. It has, it has some substantial capacity to impact us. So as much as possible, try to take advantage of your Bible courses 
with the viewpoint of having something that's alive, that reflects uh, the, your, your children getting exposed to the living Word of God in a personally meaningful fashion. Uh, again, looking at standard courses or applied courses, obviously you can use all the pre-approved study methods for Bible, uh, or when you're doing an applied course, uh, you have in the, book, in the notebook, which we, I, I will not cover, but in this notebook, there is a list of pre-approved projects. So you can use those projects as a part of creating your own applied course of study. English, again, the, the English language arts require a minimum of four credits. Um, what I would like to show you, though, is we're breaking this down between um, grammar and literature, okay? So reading it up here, English language arts disciplines consist of half a credit required each year in both grammar and literature. The student shall complete one credit each year. Now, sometimes parents make a request, can I do a whole grammar credit and a whole literature credit on alternate years? And the answer is yes, but the thing that most people get st stuck on is when you approach a standard textbook or the standard requirements in these uh, pages here, everything that we have in mind is looking at a half a credit. So if you do the course we're prescribing for literature, that's a half a credit. If you, if you take a standard Bob Jones textbook for literature, that's a half a credit. If you take a standard Bob Jones um, grammar book, that's a half a credit. Okay, so language arts has this composite sense of you get a half a credit for grammar and lit as a standard operating procedure. If you want to switch it and do a whole credit for literature or a whole credit for grammar, it would be something like doing the ninth grade Bob Jones grammar book and the 10th grade Bob Jones grammar book to get one credit in grammar, okay? Um, I think that's sufficient. Wait a minute, there's something I didn't miss. Okay, um, anthologies and textbooks are allowed. If you're doing standard courses, you can use the four pre-approved methods. Applied courses, besides reading the text, uh, the activities from real life projects and life experiences have to be approved. Um, one of the things that I will point out here with the English um, literature courses, we have been encouraging for most of the life of the school uh, that if students would potentially take advantage of reading whole books and uh, really using the literature course as an as a, um, advanced reading course and getting students to read in a minimum of 16 to 20 hundred pages a year. And so um, there is a, kind of like a standard pre-approved applied course, but if you do the reading list program, it is an applied course and so you fill it out accordingly. Um, math disciplines, again, minimum graduation requirement, two credits. The content, standard textbooks, and the student portfolio. Uh, if you use an applied course for math, it's a little bit more difficult to do an applied course because you have to have project specific activities. And as I mentioned earlier, um, a good example of a positive project specific activity that we would approve would be if you're doing a business math and you were gonna be working in a business office managing the bookkeeping for that business, um, that would be very on target with doing that type of a course. But it's a little more difficult with math to get that, so you have to, again, it's on target. The, the coursework that you're doing has to be on target. Um, I, I will mention the Walkersville policy here. Um, again, this is the way the board, we, we reevaluate it every year and the board still is standing behind our, our guideline. Um, standard um, college prep math courses include a minimum of Algebra 1, Algebra 2, and Geometry. That's kind of like a minimum standard or you get trigonometry uh, in there um, if you don't have Algebra 2 uh, written up the same way. And that's kind of the minimum expectation. Um, science is sort of, sort of similar, biology, physical science, and chemistry. Um, these are standard college prep type expectations, okay? Um, to graduate from the Walkersville Homeschool Program, we have, uh, especially with Becky's influence, tried to make the program fit uh, the entirety of the individuals that, that come our way. And so at this meeting, it's important that you understand to graduate from high school, you may take a math course that might be a general math or a business math um, or a consumer math. Those, those three courses are high school credits and they will satisfy the minimum two math disciplines. But it is important that you understand 
that in terms of a traditional college prep course of study, most colleges won't accept them as uh, sufficient um, to um, having, you didn't get geometry, you didn't get algebra one, you didn't get trigonometry. So it's important that you understand the minimum standards to graduate cover all the potential graduates in the school program. We're not just a college prep organization. And that's a very unique thing. I'm, I'm listening to the General Assembly starting to slug it out. They don't have any idea w what they are. I mean, basically, they have, it's so funny, they have um, <laughs> one bill <laughs> in the morning said, the standard for, for passing the high school assessment test is, um, is way too high. The last speaker from, from University of Maryland said, how can it be too high? There's not even one decent algebra problem on the algebra test. I mean, it's not a test for algebra, and you're calling it an algebra test. Um, so it's a real low standard. Then, then another, law, uh, another bill in the afternoon is submitted that if you're going to drop out in Maryland, you have to pass the GED to drop out. Well, the GED is not being allowed in any state as the high school assessment test because it's way too difficult. And, and nobody, no, these kids in these public schools could never pass the GED. So they're not being allowed to use it as a high school assessment test. So to flunk out of high school, you got to have a higher score than if you graduate. <laughs> But anyway, we'll just keep right on going. <laughs> um, <clears throat> approved study methods, again, primarily for math, you're going to be restricted to the standard method of review question unit test. That's pretty standard. It is possible to construct a couple of um, uh, <clears throat> unique lecture methods, but this would be more specific where the student has to actually present the lecture and do a, 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 a blackboard demonstration of all the work and grade siblings' papers as a part of um, evidencing that they have a handle on the content information. Um, Becky has always encouraged moms to use older students to help younger students learn. And uh, I, do want, I do want you to know if you take that kind of course, <clears throat> it may not be a standard algebra course, for example, uh, or a standard math course, but don't underestimate the value. When you have to teach something, you do, it does something to your learning skills that uh, just sitting and being a student doesn't give. So uh, that, that is a kind of applied course that is available, um, and we do see them once in a while <coughs> coming through. <coughs> the applied courses, basically, a little word on that, but they're not as easy to do with math. Science, again, two credits minimum. Against most, most college prep diplomas require a minimum of three to four sciences. Um, part, depending on partly what kind of a major, what kind of school you're trying to get into. Um, also, college prep requires usually a lab component. Now, uh, the Wiley textbooks that we recommend are um, that they have good homeschool oriented lab books, and there's some other uh, textbooks out there also that are considered with lab. Um, personally, <coughs> what a lab is, is some kind of an activity project and it can get incorporated into that particular course. My, my suggestion is that you, uh, if you're not going to use a lab per se, <clears throat> drop an applied course of how you want to get through that material without the lab, um, and we'll work something out with you. Uh, I taught science for many years, and um, I found that labs take a whole lot of time for a very little bit of content that you cover. and so. Um, I, I usually did all my labs in an oral lecture. In other words, I would describe what the lab would be if we did it. <laughs> we can get through like six labs at once and keep on going. <clears throat> Standard courses, of course, the four methods are easily used for science. And also for applied courses, you can also uh, do some specific projects of your own creation. Again, in the actual handbook that we have here, there are some specific pre-approved projects that you may sign up for. And um, just, just a word of communication. If you're using one of our approved applied course projects, would you tell us that you are? I'm using the applied course project number five on page 16 and you know, give a brief description of it, OK? Because if you use the one that we've already written up for you, it's pre-approved. 
Okay, you, you know, it just, you're automatically going to get, it's going to be accepted. Or you can modify it and let us re reevaluate it. Social studies, again, two credits minimum. Bible can be considered a social studies course uh, on a transcript. In fact, most colleges will accept Bible as some of the social studies courses. Of course, we, use the, we, we can use the checkoff. However, U.S. history, government, those are kind of standard mandates, and usually a, a college prep course has three, three social studies on it. <clears throat> uh, study methods, again, you can use the four pre-approved methods easily with social studies, and also we have a list of particular projects that are available if you wish to use some form of a, a non-standard uh, project for social studies. <clears throat> Phys ed, again, this gets, for some reason, gets to be a little bit difficult for people to understand and comprehend. But let me, before I go through the chart, let me just explain it real simply. Phys ed means you got worthy exercise and you kept track of it in a, in a, in a fashion that we can verify it. So with phys ed, you almost always have to use a log. There's just, unless you were in a regimented class and the class was um, conducted elsewhere and you got a grade report card from them, you know, basically you got to keep your own class log for, for phys ed. Um, the idea here, we'd like to see a minimum of 25 minutes on any one log entry to get that <coughs> cardiovascular activity upgraded. Usually you need to have QSU log. <coughs> there are some sports like golf and archery and marksmanship that are acceptable if the activity includes 25 minute periods of walking, hiking, meaning you're, you know, you're walking the, go the golf course, that would equal up to 25 minutes in the period that, it, that you were doing the exercise. Um, again, what's our objective? Our objective is primarily exercise for the kids, meaningful exercise, skill building, sport, sport development is a secondary attribute or benefit. Um, and many <coughs> sports are acceptable. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I need a glass of water, I think. Can you just pause the camera a minute? Is that ready? Okay. There's some other notes here on phys ed. You can read those for yourself. <clears throat> Christian service and work study are the two last big ones to discuss. There's a little bit of a scriptural mandate. <clears throat> Essentially, the purpose of Christian service is to train the Christian into recognizing that his call is to serve. And so we want to have some experience of that for students. Um, there's an interesting story behind our Christian service program. The Department of Education uh, asked me years ago to lobby the General Assembly for them since because uh, they were trying to imitate our Christian service program with, with something called uh, community service. So they um, called me. I was kind of shocked. I didn't know they were looking at my program that closely. <coughs> but. Um, I didn't really know how to lobby for MSDE, but um, there was a, a sense of uh, encouragement that <clears throat> being a good example sometimes has positive fruit elsewhere. <clears throat> we, we, but we require more than the public schools in terms of <clears throat> credit. We require a whole credit. <clears throat> Christian service, here's some rules. There's usually a, com a, a conflict in parental processing. What's the difference between Christian service and a work study? And essentially, Christian service should be voluntary. <clears throat> Sometimes uh, there can be a limited exception based on what's going on. But the idea of Christian service is to serve, and it's not really employment, getting a job. <clears throat> Usually a work study has some form of pay involved with it. <clears throat> There's a little list here of some of the examples of Christian service that a student can be involved in. But essentially, if you think of it from a, the narrowest perspective, Serving others meaningfully, that's Christian service. And it can be a, there's a whole gamut of the type of stuff that you can do that will be approved. Um, and there are occasions that the mixture between Christian service and work study, work study can be paid, but you, it doesn't have to be. You might get an internship somewhere of, of quite some substance and meaning, um, but you're there because you're not getting paid. You're just getting some internship experience, but that would be <clears throat> a work study experience and sometimes they can you can do one year as a work study another year can be done as a Christian service depending on what it is again we want them to be pre-approved for the express purpose of making sure that 
you don't get to the end of the year and then get disappointed that, well, that really wasn't Christian service, wasn't what we had in mind. So make sure it's pre-approved. That doesn't mean, though, if you find looking backward that there are some things that you did that potentially could qualify for Christian service or work study, apply for it. We would, we would rather see multiple hours in both of these discipline areas, if at all possible. <clears throat> Again, a QSU log is going to be necessary for getting credit for Christian service. Work study is very similar except it has to do with learning how to provide for yourself and so it, it may and, and, it's, and it's desirous that it might have some uh, some payment involved with it <coughs> but it doesn't have to. Um, example work studies <coughs> could be apprenticeships, security guard, office assistant, librarian. These are just a little bit of loose potentials that students could be involved in. <coughs> Again, pre-approval is also necessary. One of the things about work study that I'd encourage you, um, they're actually in the program for a reason. Uh, from a philosophical standpoint, often a child's education gets a really big boost <coughs> when they have a little bit of field work and there's a sense of connection. <coughs> I need skills and training to, in order to do these kinds of things. And so it, it's kind of an important aspect of salting the oats for, for young people as they're trying to discern perhaps the different areas of skills and calling and how they're going to earn a living, a livelihood in the years to come. <clears throat> so those are both required. And again, you can have more than one credit, but you must have a minimum of one each. The electives, I've already spent some time concerning these, but the electric, excuse me, the elective subjects simply give you the ability to tweak as much as possible the unique emphasis for your son or daughter. And they're, they're pretty much the gamut. Any particular area that has of substantive benefit, uh, if they get the course approved, it can be accepted for <coughs> electives. Again, I just want to remind you, though, that if you're looking for college prep uh, courses, you'll have to use some of your electives to do college prep uh, courses of study. <coughs> obviously, you can use standard course methods or applied course methods, uh, and obviously, uh, it depends on exactly how you present it. Uh, what kind of credit or how that project will look. Many times electives are involved in courses that require QSUs. <clears throat> and the last thing here that's relating to academics is the um, research paper requirement. <clears throat> Every student is required to submit a research paper in order to graduate from the school. <clears throat> this research paper does not necessarily uh, receive credit of its own unless the research paper is done in conjunction with a specific course. Uh, the Walkersville School has attempted to offer a research course every year. We're, we're in our, I don't know what year, we've, we've done it successfully every year. This year is the first year that we've videotaped it. So <clears throat> starting next year, we'll have in our bookstore the ability for you to purchase the entire research course on DVD to be done at your own home. However, um, if you want to have credit and have me directly involved in reviewing the student work, you'll have to sign up you know, specifically with that intention so that I can do the review of the student work during the course of the year. Um, <clears throat> this year is the first year of actually, we've run concurrently. We're doing one remote class by DVD with a group of about five or six students. And um, I'm surprised, but uh, the students who are doing it by DVD are doing exactly the same as the ones who are doing it live in person. So uh, I'm, I'm grateful that the course seems to uh, meet the need. But um, <clears throat> this, re this paper requirement is probably one of the most significant requirements that we've had for such a small requirement. It's reaped tremendously positive benefits for uh, the homeschool students in our um, school. <clears throat> Some of the details of this paper requirement is for your obligation to read. You don't have to take our course. You can uh, submit your paper on your own. <clears throat> but um, those are the requirements listed for you in doing that paper. I'm not going to, if I went over them, you'd still forget it by the time you got to doing it. Uh, fi finally, graduation and transcripts. <clears throat> you must um, turn in your records to um, get your transcript. I remember um, pulling out a transcript for a mom and a dad at a home visit 
And I, it was, I think it was somebody else's transcript I was just illustrating, you know. And they said, well, that's really neat. Where do you get one of those things? <laughs> I said, if you turn in your reports, you'll get one. <laughs> and they turned red and realized, okay, you got me on that one. <clears throat> Financial accounts must be paid up to graduate. And <clears throat> the last section deals with appearance and behavior. And um, this is the one thing I don't want to rush through too much. And, I, and, and then we'll, be, we'll take some question and answer. Um, for whatever reason, uh, we live in a culture today that's increasingly worldly, um, probably by pretty much everybody's standards. Uh, I mean, some people might not have any standards, and then I guess it wouldn't qualify to them. Um, <clears throat> I personally recognize from my background as a believer that um, it's possible to um, uh, abuse standards, as it were, in some fashion and um, create confusion or whatever with, and we have families coming from quite a few different church backgrounds. But <clears throat> I, there's some real simple reasons behind the standards of the school, and so I'd like to express what the standards are and why, and then if you have any questions, maybe I can answer them as we go. Um, at the functions and activities that we sponsor as a school, when you participate in those functions, we simply want the students to be a godly testimony to each other, uh, parents and younger children and outsiders. And so, uh, you know, that's probably asking a lot to have students be a godly example. But the objective is just for testimony's sake. I, I don't know um, about you, but I just think it's a common way to raise our children to, when you're out in public, to say, you know, let's be an example to others. Uh, let's be a positive, encouraging example. You could be a good example or a bad example. So I guess a godly example, a, a godly testimony is someone that shows a, a spirit that says, you know, I want to do things to glorify the Lord. Um, I realize that how we dress and look, um, you know, in all honesty, it's, it's, it ought to come from our individual pursuit of the Lord. And it isn't the school's desire to set personal standards for anyone. Uh, and the effort that we're putting here has nothing to do with the effort that you ought to put into deciding for, per, for personal appearance and behavior, standards for your own family. <clears throat> what we try to do, though, is have standards that reflect the ability to get together without unnecessary um, temptation and stress in, in the group appearance. Now, um, in the old days, the dress code for Walkersville events was this. All students, families participating in all functions associated with the school, the dress code is modest and conservative. Now that's not a very long definition of a dress code, modest and conservative. Uh, you may not agree with our standards, but we want, we want you to honor without murmuring or complaining. Now the problem is um, people didn't know what modest and conservative was. After a few years, we started having um, wanting things wanting to be more spelled out. So let me go through the definition of modest and conservative as the school has intended it. Uh, no short or tight, excuse me, no short or tight shirts, pants, skirts, or dresses. This means that knees and stomachs and shoulders are covered. Again, uh, modest means to cover adequately uh, and not draw attention visually. And we know that men and young boys are attracted with their eyes, and so the idea is to keep things uh, properly covered so we're not attracting in that fashion. Uh, anything that's too tight draws attention to form, and anything that's too bare draws attention to um, form and, and it's a temptation. Uh, B, skirts for ladies and tucked in collared shirts and ties for gentlemen may be required at certain events. Now, you'll, you'll know that when you get invited to the event. You'll see the dress code requires, um, this is what we call business dress. Um, number C, uh, no wearing of excessive current fashions. If you inquire at the office if you have a question. Now, what's an excessive current fashion? Well, I realize that's a vague rule, and it can change over time. <coughs> but. Um, if the idea is conservative and modest, 
something that's excessive would tend to draw attention to the person. Uh, something that's excessive would be something that it's really important to the child to wear because it really means something to be wearing that particular kind of thing. That's, that's in the borderline of excessive. The purpose of gathering together isn't to model the latest fashions. And that doesn't mean that <laughs> the fashions that you might enjoy modeling at home is, isn't just fine with your family because it's, it's not a matter of me imposing on your home these standards. But I will say from the experience I've had over the years as a parent in the school, <clears throat> when you can remove from a group of people the kinds of temptations that attract youth to get their attention in the wrong direction, you're helping the group activity to be more edifying. It's just, uh, I, you know, it's a phenomenal thing that even the public schools now are beginning to consider uniforms. And I was at a hearing in Annapolis last week and this public school group came in. They're all in uniforms, look like little Catholic kids, you know, the little plaid blue outfits. <clears throat> and why? Why are the uniforms? It's just one thing. It's not the, it's not the school's goal to impose uh, what the dress code is, <clears throat> but by having a uniform standard, what do you do? You, you subtract from the group activity that added layer of ego, competition, showing off, wrong motives, which isn't edifying. I mean, the bottom line is, and, and I'll be honest, okay, it has been extremely discouraging to me. Probably the only thing that I've been really discouraged with in the ministry, with the school here, is when there's thoughtlessness by parents and children when it comes to dress. And we're just so selfishly centered on what I want to look like for whatever reason I have that we're not considering the fact that my appearance impacts other people. And the whole purpose is if we were going to have a fashion show, we'd call it. You know, we could call it Crazy Day and you know, wear the weirdest thing that you can wear. You know, that's fine. We'd have a fun time. That would be the objective. <clears throat> but that's not our objective. And I have watched the benefit of youth gathering together improve or decline exclusively around whether the kids are coming with an attitude of me being on display versus that's just kind of removed. And we don't have that attitude centerfold. And we, we, the purpose that we gathered for.